good afternoon um, to all of you. I hope you enjoyed your, well, I assume private lunch, uh, all of you. Welcome to uh, session 11A, which is uh, about rocky roads, opportunities and challenges in open publishing. Um, we have, um, my name is Joer Rademakers. I'm from uh, Libis at KO Leuven uh, Libraries. I am uh, the director of Libis um, and I am since 2000, 11 or 2012, I don't even remember, it's that long, member of the program committee of the annual uh, conference. Um, we um, are asked to share some of the uh, of the house rules um, for uh, Liber. Uh, uh, you already probably heard uh, those, but it's always good to, uh, uh, to, uh, to repeat those uh, rules. You do know that these sessions are um, are recorded and made available uh, later on. If you do have uh, questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat. We will monitor the chat. And after all of the speakers have done their talk, we will uh, jump in those questions and ask uh, and present them to the, to the different speakers. Um, if you do have um, anything, um, technical uh, problem and so on and so on. Uh, put that also in the chat and we will start uh, and we will look into uh, possible uh, sol um, solutions. And without further uh, ado, I uh, would like to start uh, the, ses the, the session. And our first speaker is going to talk about, um, um, Oh, maybe I should uh, also in indeed mention that that we changed the order of the of the speakers, and we will start with uh, Massimo uh, Custer, who will start talking about behavioral reluctance in adopting open access publishing uh, insights from a goal-directed perspective. Massimo Custer is um, a PhD student at uh, at my university at KU Leuven, um, has. Uh, uh, a master's degree in social and uh, environmental psychology from the University of Groningen, so he is a real low lender, uh, we could say. Um, and he is uh, working on uh, theoretical and empirical work um, on goals, uh, goal-directed causes of behavior. And he's going to talk, is one of his latest uh, uh, things that he uh, worked on was um, reluctance of researchers to adopt open publishing, uh, open access publishing. So uh, Massimo, the floor is yours. Mm, yes, let me try to quickly manage to share the screen. Uh, uh, it says that you would have to stop sharing your screen and then can try again. And that's always, so we just tried it a second ago and it worked and now, now you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay, uh, thanks Joe for this nice uh, short introduction and welcome everyone. I'm very honored to kick off today's session uh, with regards to the rocky road towards open access publishing with I think a quite uh, fitting uh, topic, which is the behavioral reluctance in adopting open access publishing by researchers. And um, I will talk about this topic from the perspective of a behavioral scientist. So I think that's uh, that's, I think, the, the, the interesting aspect of this, this uh, talk. And I also want to therefore start by stressing a bit the perspective or background that I took uh, with which I look at uh, open access publishing, which is that I'm a behavioral scientist, I'm a psychologist. And I heard today there are people from various uh, backgrounds here in the audience. And uh, so when, as a behavioral science, uh, scientist, when I look at issues or problems 
such as the COVID-19 pandemic or climate change. What I see are problems that uh, require large-scale behavior change, right? So with the COVID uh, pandemic, we had to establish new rules of uh, behavior of conduct, uh, such as wearing masks, keeping distance. With climate change, we have to start changing our uh, energy intensive behaviors. And uh, with uh, issues like these, there are certainly also structural problems that need to be resolved. And that's also the case with uh, open access publishing. But uh, I want to look at open access publishing from, uh, from the same perspective, namely uh, looking at it as a, an issue that requires a large scale behavior change by a, a big number of researchers actually. And what makes this, I think a quite interesting topic or also um, important, uh, one, one first uh, point to establish the importance of, of this uh, topic is that actually by uh, changing uh, publishing behavior by researchers, we can uh, help to alleviate some of the other problems we're facing. And that has been, I think, quite nicely illustrated by the COVID pandemic where certain journals started making research uh, on COVID related issues publicly accessible. And I think that quite nicely illustrates that accessibility of research can actually help to address uh, other problems more effectively. But uh, more effective science is just one of the good reasons why open access publishing should happen. Uh, and that relates to um, the accessibility of knowledge, but also faster dissemination of knowledge. Um, but there are other good reasons, such as uh, the argument that research is based on public funds, so it should also be uh, accessible to the public. Um, also, uh, uh, open access published uh, research receives more media coverage, thus has a higher societal impact, one might say. Um, also, it has been shown that open access publications receive more citations, authors retain their rights on the, on the print. And also recently, I think quite interesting that open access starts to become uh, increasingly benefiting for early career researchers in their career progression. And uh, the reason why I highlighted uh, some aspects in blue are these are aspects that might speak especially to uh, researchers. So uh, more citations, retaining author rights or career progression are maybe things that would be interesting to researchers for good reasons why they should actually engage in open access publishing. And this is by far not an extensive list for review of uh, other benefits. You can find it here in this, in this uh, article, but also I think there's such a large group of people here. If we were to have a blackboard and we would start drawing uh, what uh, uh, everyone would start putting a good reason for open access publishing would end up with a huge list actually. So I think there are many good reasons to do it. And in line with this, I can also say that open access publishing is happening. So uh, open access publications are on the rise. Uh, and uh, in this uh, study by Povova, I think uh, the, this, like the latest estimates actually that 45% of uh, articles are open access. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, if you look at the graph, you can also see that it is not really happening yet. So there's a large uh, gray bit, which are, are still uh, published or uh, articles published in closed access journals. And you can also see that publications are generally on the rise. So an increase in open access publications is to be just uh, already expected due to a general increase in the number of publications that are coming out. And also interestingly, uh, some studies show that uh, that researchers, most researchers actually have a positive attitude towards open access publications. And, um, but at the same time, when they are asked about their own publishing behavior, many report that they uh, do not do it themselves yet or haven't done it yet. So there's a huge uh, gap between uh, what people find important and what they actually do. These numbers are from a study from 2011, but also more recent studies show similar patterns that the attitude towards engaging in open access publishing is more positive than what researchers end up doing. And today, uh, from my uh, behavioral scientist perspective, I want to walk you through three steps, basically, in, in understanding and addressing this behavioral reluctance. 
first, I want to try to establish why uh, researchers might actually publish in, uh, in open access journals from uh, a goal-directed perspective. And then uh, once I have tried to establish that, I will uh, point out uh, factors that might hinder uh, open access publishing based on what I think causes open access publishing. And third, I will also try to formulate or point out potential uh, strategies how to uh, address these identified barriers. Okay, so the goal directed framework, this will be the most theoretical bit of the whole talk, so please bear with me. Um, and uh, but the, the most basic premise uh, you would need to understand from a goal directed perspective is that we assume that people act based on certain goals they have, certain things they value, and uh, on their expectations or beliefs on how they will actually uh, get to achieve these goals. Okay, what is depicted here as S is just basically the status quo, the environment, because life always happens in a certain environment. And uh, we have a certain perception of this environment, uh, which might not necessarily reflect how the environment is, but we have a certain perception. And from the school director's perspective, as mentioned, we also always have a certain goal in mind. For convenience sake, let's start with the goal to make research publicly accessible. Let's assume that's a goal by a researcher. And the researcher perceives uh, that most research is published in closed access journals. Now, uh, these, the goal and the, the perceived status quo are being compared. And if there's no discrepancy, which would mean a researcher uh, thinks publicly accessible research is important and thinks that uh, the fact that most uh, research is published in closed access journals means that it is publicly accessible, then the researcher would probably not do anything about it. So that uh, nothing more would happen here. But if a discrepancy is perceived between the two so that, that the, the researcher realizes our research is actually not accessible to the public, then the researcher formulates a goal to reduce this discrepancy, to do something about it. And there are three broad strategies that the researcher can engage in. The first we call recommendation, which is basically to change the value the researcher ascribes to the goal, in this case of public accessible research. So the researcher might uh, uh, reason for him or herself that it is not that important after all. Uh, so then it wouldn't be discrepant anymore. A researcher might also engage in immunization so to change the perception of the environment, so to not uh, see research as being uh, published in closed access journals to be discrepant with the goal of public accessibility. That could be, for example, uh, that the researcher thinks uh, media will communicate the findings of closed access journals, so uh, publishing in closed access journals is not discrepant. Uh, and now comes the interesting bit, which is assimilation, which is basically to engage in a behavior to reduce the discrepancy, because that's where open access publishing might happen. When it comes to assimilation, uh, uh, people have a certain action repertoire, so certain behaviors that they can choose from or engage in, and one of them might be open access publishing. Another one might be writing a blog post about one's research. And uh, now that's where uh, expectancies become important because uh, we choose the, uh, the behavior that has the highest expectancy to result in the goal that we would want to achieve. So for example, the expectancy that open access publishing leads to publicly accessible research is compared to the expectancy that writing a blog post would result in publicly accessible research. And if uh, the expectancy of open access publishing is higher, the researcher should formulate the intention to do it, and that should then result in an actual publishing of, uh, in an open access journal. Okay, now <laughs> I hope uh, that was not too theoretical and too fast, but- uh, uh, Massimo, Massimo yeah. you're halfway. Okay, that sounds about good. Okay. Um, okay, now we come to understanding reluctance. So if, if that is uh, what we assume underlies open access publishing, then why from this perspective might researchers not do it? What would be barriers in this cycle, basically? 
And uh, I want to talk about four different factors, uh, the values that researchers ascribe to goals, the detection of discrepancy, their external repertoire, and their expectations. And uh, when I uh, mention these factors or explain them, I will also immediately always link them to certain potential intervention strategies. So let's start with the values of goals. So uh, it could be that researchers ascribe a low relative value, uh, the low uh, value to the relevant goal relative to other goals. So for example, publicly accessible research might not be as important as publishing in a prestigious journal or saving on author processing fees or individual um, publication costs. Um, and to, uh, I had to illustrate, uh, for example, it was shown that uh, general reputation was the most uh, important criteria for while open access actually only ranked 14th out of one might try to increase the value of the relevant goal, right? This can be done through direct persuasion by telling researchers publicly accessible research is a really important thing. But another strategy could be to stress existing benefits, such as um, that, uh, pub that open access publications have a higher impact on societal debates. One might also uh, communicate an injunctive norm, which basically tells researchers that others peers value open access publications, which uh, at the same time communicates uh, that there's a, an additional benefit of doing it, which might, which would be to gain approval by this peers. So for example, a research group might communicate on their mission statement, uh, open access publishing is a very important part of who we are, uh, and that uh, might uh, encourage them, uh, others to to do it because they want to be seen as a good researcher by this group. Uh, another way could be to create novel benefits. So for example, to establish accessibility awards or to make it an important uh, quality criterion for the allocation of research grants. And uh, this is uh, apparently happening. And also, as I said earlier in this study, it was shown that it is increasingly seen to be actually beneficial for career progression to publish in open access journals. Uh, another strategy could be to uh, actually decrease the value of the conflicting goal. So, uh, and this could be also done by reducing the benefits of the conflicting goals. So for example, prestigious journals uh, might not no longer be seen as a metric for excellence. And one might put more weight on the degree to which research serves the public good, which was a suggestion by Alperin and colleagues, or also, uh, in the declaration, declaration on research assessment that has been, I think, made clear that uh, there might be other metrics and uh, that less weight should be put on impact factors of journals in assessing the quality of research. A third strategy when it comes to values of goals might be to minimize the conflict between the goals. So with this illustration, basically to take away the scale uh, so that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, publishing in open access uh, journals is no longer at stake with uh, publishing in a prestigious journal, for example, uh, which would call for the establishment of more prestigious open access journals. And uh, another example with author processing fees, uh, universities may offer to pay author processing fees or to take care of the administrative burden of doing so, which is, I think, more and more realized in these transformative agreements, which I'm sure also have still some other downsides, but yeah, so uh, things are happening. And uh, another example would be to establish more diamond journals. And I heard some really interesting talks here uh, that there can be actually a sustainable way of having a diamond journal. The discrepancy detection might be a second factor that might hinder uh, open access publishing. So, uh, which means that researchers might underestimate or fail to see an accessibility uh, uh, of closed access journals to the public. So it is also, I think, an important step to illustrate this inaccessibility more uh, strongly. So for example, I couldn't find the percentage, but if it would be communicated, uh, how, how many, uh, uh, how big the percentages in the world population that has actually access to uh, 
research that you publish in a certain close access journal, that would be, I think, a strong message because I, I guess it would be a quite small number. Uh, also, one could illustrate the seriousness of the consequences. So, for example, uh, how much uh, early career researchers from prestigious universities spend on average of their personal salary to gain access. For example, some colleagues in India uh, that I work with, uh, some PhD students, they told me they spent on average 50% of their salary uh, on access to journals. Then uh, the third factor is the action repertoire. So the desired behavior of open access publishing might not be uh, known or not not come to mind. So it's also going to be uh, important to teach about open uh, access publishing more uh, or to have uh, things such as the DOAJ, which is uh, uh, like in uh, a website where you can easily find uh, open access journals depending on your needs, your language, the author processing fees you're willing to pay, and so on. So it's a very nice uh, platform, I think. But also universities such as the Kai Leuven has, for example, an open science platform, which informs researchers about the options and also about author processing fees, about funds that might be available to, to do it, and so on. Uh, another thing, if it does not come to mind, it might be also important to just increase the salience of open access publishing in the university context. That can be done with behavioral prompts, such as with uh, stickers. So that's something I've been working on with a colleague uh, to, uh, yeah, to make stickers, basically. Uh, if everyone in the research group would have such a sticker, or if, I don't know, at a conference, uh, this might also just put open access publishing more in the, yeah, just put it more in the, in the foreground or more in the, in the room of where researchers are. And uh, another thing could be that researchers actually want to publish open access they have the intention, but there's an actual lack of the response option to do so. For example, if you're in a research domain where there is no suitable uh, open access journal yet, so it will be also uh, very important to make the environment conducive to open access publishing by increasing the range of open access journals, for example. Now, last point, we'll talk about expectancies very briefly. So it could also be that researchers have a low expectancy that open access publishing leads to public accessible research. And I think that's a common problem with uh, yeah, behavioral uh, change, which require many people to engage in a behavior to actually do something. A, a single researcher might not feel that if I now publish in an open access journal, that this would make a difference. So it's also important to communicate that every open access publication makes a difference. Um, and one might also reframe the goal to, more, to a more achievable goal. So uh, from uh, making research publicly accessible, one might reframe it to making a certain domain or a certain research topic publicly accessible. So if I'm doing research on discrimination, if I say to myself, oh, my goal is to make uh, research on discrimination publicly accessible, that sounds more achievable than making research in general publicly accessible. Uh, another option could be to, do, to communicate a descriptive norm, which basically just communicates how many others already do it. And that might also make a single researcher feel more like, uh, if I also do it, that it will contribute to an actual change. Um, okay, one minute, yes. Simon. One yep. minute. I will wrap up. Here's the full picture, which you can find in a recent publication, uh, where we try to, where you can see the the model and the problems that might arise and the interventions listed alongside the model. So I encourage you to read uh, this publication if you're interested in more. And also in this publication, we have a, a exemplary goal hierarchy that we So uh, yeah, if you, I encourage you to have a look. The conclusion, I think uh, large-scale open access publishing requires uh, behavioral change by many, and I also think that behavioral science can contribute to this transition by identifying structural barriers, but also by identifying aspects that need to be communicated and how, such as injunctive norms, descriptive norms, um, and uh, yes.
some references and before the time ends, I also want to say that all this didn't grow on my own head. I had a lot of nice collaborators in this project. Uh, Agnes Moss, Jan de Hauer, Tony Ross Hellauer, Inge van Nuremberg, and Frederik Verbrugge. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have questions. And um, yeah, I think that was uh, those were 20 minutes. Very well timed, Massimo. You did it uh, terrific. Um, thank you, uh, Massimo. Massimo the, our next talk is about the evolving uh, scholar and rethinking uh, publishing. Um, we have two speakers. Um, it's um, the first one is Nicoletta uh, Nastasi, who is from the uh, uh, Delft University of uh, Technology. She is an innovation consultant at uh, TU Delft Open and is passionate about innovative solutions, scholarly publishing, rewarding and recognition models, models gamification and uh, user experiences. She's powered by curiosity. We also are uh, now mm -hmm. uh, enjoys learning and discovering new things. And our second uh, uh, person who's gonna uh, assist uh, Nicoletta with uh, the questions is Frederic Belliard. And we are a little bit jealous uh, of her because she's in Martinique at this moment. And weather is, I hope, better than here over in Leuven. She is also working for uh, TU Delft, uh, TU Delft Library in this case. Uh, she is an open publishing, open access advocate and open scholarly communication lead at TU Delft Library. She's a fervent supporter of open science and strives to help researchers disseminating their work as well as getting recognition. Nicoletta, I think it's up to you. Asmo, Hello, do everyone. you shut down your video? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'll tell you about uh, our initiative at uh, Delft University of Technology Library. That's the Evolving Scholar. Um, I'll tell you about uh, our stories, uh, challenges, and lessons learned. With so much happening in the scholarly communications, everyone in academia is busy developing new environments, new channels, trying different approaches for the benefit of everyone. And thank you, Massimo, for your nice introduction, because we are a very good study case for you. Um, <laughs> at TU Delft, we launched uh, the Evolving Scholar. So this is a single article mega journal. Uh, in, we launched in the autumn last year. But our story in, uh, in open publishing started earlier. So we launched uh, our publishing platform, Teodolft Open, in 2019. Uh, as you see, we are a diamond open access uh, academic publisher. Uh, we, th this was a response to the increased activity within the Teodolft community. They started already to create open access journals. So um, there we were, and we have now three lines of development uh, journals. We have open access books and we have open access textbooks. But while the journals are managed uh, by the faculties, uh, we wanted to create our, well, uh, single article publishing journal managed by us. So this was actually the result of a series of interviews uh, with researchers. And this is our solution to the multitude of problems we heard from them. Lack of transparency, visibility, recognition, um, but mostly uh, they needed a place to publish open access. And just that time Coalition S uh, was announcing their plans for uh, um, publishing open access. Uh, so with that design, with the design in mind of what we wanted to do, we'd look for the right infrastructure. So. Here is uh, what we have. This is the uh, Evolving Scholar uh, logo. Uh, we started a pilot with uh, Orvium, a startup from uh, CERN. Uh, they developed their platform actually with the same goals in mind as ours. So um, we wanted uh, that our solution embraces beside open access single article publishing, new forms of publications, uh, open peer review and uh, community. We wanted a community driven platform with the review process in the hands of the reviewers and the authors. Our rethinking of publishing actually it's about um, 
building a good foundation. And this is, was this platform with these solid, require, solid requirements and just let the community share their research in their form of convenience. While we try to develop together with them collections, uh, we let them develop their taxonomies uh, and we facilitate the pro process of peer review with the promise of transparency, of course. So rethinking publishing, we had to zoom in at the core needs of change in publishing. Um, how could we act on them? Here are the gaps and wishes of researchers, uh, like the first two, one, the invisible work during the research uh, itself and with it the lack of recognition, and two, another problem, the lack of control of the publishing process. Um, our wish was to make the platform a sort of an experimental space and not to fix it. Um, in order to do that, we decided to uh, consider the researchers' needs of publishing. So that means becoming a companion during the, their research life cycle. Then uh, to let them the control of uh, the publishing process uh, and of course of the scientific quality. So here it comes the open peer review and community driven. And then uh, come with our bits of new de developments in publishing, but also let them the freedom and let them try. And this would be the experimental part and collaborative space. I'll uh, tell you now about uh, some examples of our approach. These are researchers needs. Um, these are fictive researchers and uh, a fifth, fictive colleague, but the, the stories are uh, real, the needs are real. And I'll go into detail uh, now. This is uh, Marianne, um, an uh, um, assistant professor, she wants to organize a conference in six months and she's looking for help. The participants of the conference have three months to write the full conference paper. And then the organizers wish, wish to make uh, those papers freely accessible with only one, two weeks before the start of the conference. But the, uh, there is no way that the review process uh, can begin then. So our solution was to um, create these conference papers in a model of preprint plus open peer review, uh, where the, the, the scientific community takes the control of the publication process and the organizers and the authors will uh, be responsible for engaging the community in the open peer review. Another example is uh, from uh, Andreas. Uh, he's storing his data sets in uh, our 4TU research data. Well, it's the data repository for four technical university in the Netherlands. Um, his data is uh, fair, but he wants to add a quality stamp to it. And practically we could can do this uh, by importing the data sets in our uh, platform. Uh, we start the peer review process, uh, we can give DOIs for the reviews and in this way we can help uh, recognize uh, the people who are doing that. Everything is to ensure that the researchers also focuses on the data quality and consistency and viability instead of generating more data. Another uh, example, uh, maybe you recognize it is about uh, the topic collection. Uh, this is uh, an example of um, a colleague of ours um, who is a coordinator of uh, the citizen science program development within the uh, open science wide strategical program at our university. With uh, her team, she wants to create a publishing channel for citizen scientists, whether they are researchers, students or citizens. Um, this is, could be the example of the beginning of creating more topic collections. Um, the topics, uh, well, the, the collections, uh, if they get enough mass, then they, create, uh, they can create their own identity as a collection. And then again, the researchers are free to, uh, to, to take control, to, to drive the whole review process. There are also other requests like the book reviews, uh, video abstracts for the scientific articles and also conversations 
these are bits of uh, opinions uh, around articles already published, but uh, meant to engage people in whatever they have to say in hot topics or just something they have to say about the, the issue in a, a discussion. So looking at all these, these are all, uh, let's say, recent uh, situation, recent uh, requests. These are our solutions, but as you can imagine, we cannot uh, approach all of them uh, with our team. So we had to look at uh, the impact and actually we decided that the conference papers, topic collection and data peer review can be uh, uh, taken into account uh, uh, this year, you know, on parallel tracks and also uh, the book reviews as a low hanging fruit. Now, do you recognize maybe this image? I cannot hear you. Maybe you uh, you write in the in the chat. It's about the message. This is what is called the desire path, and it's a term used in design thinking. Um, it's it shows how people move from the point A to point B despite the initial design. Um, actually, when I spoke about our vision of the evolving scholar, here you have to imagine not a park with uh, alleys but a full green grass field. This is our idea. Uh, rethinking publishing is about creating this environment and apply the desire path principle. So let the researcher walk, make their own pathways in publishing and just walk with them, build together and then put the tiles. One small example is uh, uh, like this. It could look like this. This is the distribution of roles and activities uh, for two uh, different uh, publication types. So this can vary. These are just uh, two examples. But uh, what I want to say is that actually every solution, we want to approach it with a design thinking framework in mind. And now we come at the challenges. And Massimo will uh, recognize uh, some of, uh, uh, of uh, them. Novel publication types. You know that researchers are enthusiastic about the concept of open science, as Massimo said, but when publishing open access or open peer review, they, they, they have barriers to cross, like age index, impact factor, and we get the question, who is listening to me here? Um, these uh, challenges, um, to solve these challenges, it requires time. It requires good strategies. And thank you again, Massimo, for the strategies you presented. And, but also, uh, last but not least, the technical support. This is uh, one big challenge, I would say. Uh, another one, the open peer review. Um, we embrace open peer review, but honestly, not everyone believes in it. So we stay open then uh, to let people uh, do the review uh, behind doors if they want to, uh, or uh, anonymous, and just publish the reviews uh, in one case after the completion of the review process, anonymous or not. We go for open identity. The Last challenge, big challenge is the part of the community driven. So it's about how much control you give. Uh, we decided to add a minimal editorial layer. It helps also with the indexing bodies with uh, DOIJ, the uh, Directory of Open Access Journals. And uh, this editorial layer will be the first filter in their expert community. From there on, the interaction will be in the control of the community itself. Uh, I want to mention that for uh, the interaction in the community, we didn't uh, add a negative reputation. Uh, so that means that the editors will be moderators and they will have to intervene in case of conflicts. Um, we decided to ask you for help, but um, actually uh, not now. Um, this is a, a website, you can go with a QR code, 
um, it would uh, help us if you would like to to uh, contribute. There are three columns there with three the three challenges, and every challenge has three statements. They are related to embracing uh, the behavior, embracing uh, when embracing a new idea or habit. You have the enthusiasts, you have the neutral people, and you have the non-believers. And for all of them, uh, uh, there are statements. Underneath the statements, please, you can write your opinions or messages. Um, it will stay, the, the website will stay open uh, after the conference. Um, okay, so now I'm going to back to, um, I'm going to the lessons learned. We had two reflections, be ag agile and be present. So what we learned is that um, from the moment we hear of the problems, uh, from the problems of the researchers till we uh, get a solution, uh, a big solution, then this takes time. If we are, if we are not agile, then uh, the researchers will manage uh, by themselves. Probably you know that. It, when we are would be ready with a solution, they are up and they they have another up and running solution. So it's good to to keep in touch. Um, this is part of the rethinking. Be agile and be present because sometimes just uh, having a chat it helps. The bottlenecks will be gone. The researcher can share his frustrations. About what next? I intended to write here what exactly are we going to do, but I mean, this is about working on the solutions. But the whole thing actually is what we want is to put some bricks on the foundation of open science for the free flow of knowledge. This is this motto, the motto of our library. Um, This is, in any case, uh, bigger than, uh, than us, open science. Uh, now, the evolving scholar, this is, uh, I told you, uh, developed in collaboration with Orvium. We promised an interactive session, but with an unstable internet connection, this is a risky business. So you have here the links. Uh, we invite you to, to, to visit us. And uh, I prepare for you some uh, screenshots uh, from our platform to let you see how we support the publishing uh, uh, workflow in the evolving scholar. So this is the page of, um, let me see, this is the page of uh, Orvium. I have to get my, uh, well, it seems that I cannot get my uh, mouse to the uh, to the screen. It's not visible. So no, uh, no, it's not please, visible. No, it's not visible. I cannot uh, click. If I click on it, I'm going further. So, oh yes, it's working. So, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, so this is the, the web page of Orvium. You can see the uh, my publication communities, my reviews and uh, papers to review. Uh, you have the um, uh, taxonomy, our taxonomy, and you have, you see the uh, evolving scholar as a community. If we go further, this is inside the, the evolving scholar community. There are not many papers. We are very, very in the beginning. Um, we have uh, the community guidelines. I didn't, the moderators, I, I didn't take a shot for everything, but this is one of a publication. This is a preprint. Uh, you can do have comments. There are only 300 views. It's not for a long time shared. Uh, here you can see the, on the uh, upper side, the draft pending approval uh, preprint, and it's there. It's stopped there. Um, then uh, these are the uh, data of the of the publication of the DOI. We are uh, giving the DOI, the license, and the publication type. Well, you can log in in Orvium with uh, Orchid, and if you log in, then you can, of course, become an author or become a reviewer. 
and if you give your preferences then uh, you can be at the end practically called to be a reviewer, asked to be a reviewer in a certain topic. Okay. With that, I'm uh, finishing my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, visit us, please visit us. And uh, mostly uh, go to the Padlet and help us with our challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicoletta, and uh, you're nice in time. <laughs> So then we can uh, go uh, to the next uh, speaker of today. Uh, her talk is about monitoring open science and it will be done by Letitia Braco, who's a, a library curator at the University of Lorraine, uh, where she is uh, holding the position of a data librarian. In that uh, position, she helps uh, doctoral uh, students and researchers in the management of their research data. Uh, and she is also working in the domain of bibliometrics, uh, where she is uh, co-piloting uh, a data open science working group uh, of Couperin uh, at the national level. She has a, a rather um, um, a broad background, I have to say. She worked as a universe as a, a librarian at the uh, Library of Law, Economics, Management. Um, in the uh, Haute Al Alsace, and she was head of the University Heritage Library uh, of the, in the Industrial Society of Mulhouse. So, Leticia, uh, it's up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, for this very uh, complete <laughs> presentation. <Yeah. laughs> so, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to conclude uh, this session after these uh, two highly uh, interesting presentations. So, so I hope um, I'll take up the challenge too. Um, so now that we've talked about um, all these, uh, these challenges uh, with the two first presentations, let's have a look on how we can uh, monitor uh, open science uh, with the example of the University of Florin. So um, to begin, I would like to briefly uh, describe the context. So the University of Lorraine, uh, it's in the northeast of France. Um, it's a multidisciplinary university with uh, 60,000 students and 2,400 uh, researchers um, in 60 laboratories. The university is strongly committed to open science. We have had um, an institutional uh, archive called HAL uh, since 2016. And since 2018, the board of directors has asked all researchers to enter the references of all their publications in this archive with uh, the full text uh, for articles. Since 2019, we have an open science uh, steering committee from which two operational committees have emerged, one dedicated to research data and the other one to open publications. We also have a network of 15 librarians for research support, whose mission is to accompany uh, researchers in the use of the open archive and to control uh, the quality of deposits. We have been organizing symposia dedicated to open science every, every year since uh, 2018. So um, a strong political commitment and human resources have therefore been brought together in favor of open science. So how can we measure the effects of this policy and the progress of open science based on the scientific production of the university? In 2019, the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation published the French Open Science Monitor. On this web page, we, you will find different graphs uh, presenting various indicators, the global rate of opening of publications for the considered year, um, an evolution by year, and also the rate of opening by discipline and by publisher. In an open data strategy, the ministry has made available all the data sets used to create the graphs, as well as the code and the documentation to understand how the project has been realized. 
as the scripts are freely reusable, why not use them to do the same work, but this time only on the publications of the University of Lorraine? That's when the documentation and publishing department asked me to set up the Open Science Monitor for the institution. So I learned the Python programming language and was trained more, speci more specifically in data analysis to carry out uh, this project. So the first challenge was to isolate uh, the University of Florence production. But why is it a particular challenge? Simply because it was not possible to take the French uh, corpus and keep only the necessary publications. Indeed, there is no exhaustive bibliographic catalogue in which all the French publications would be listed. There are many different tools, uh, open archives, of course, but also commercial databases such as uh, the Web of Science, Corpus, uh, you have also Google Scholar, of course. Um, to carry out the French monitor, the ministry's team of developers created parsers, um, in other words, detection tools on web pages that identify affiliations that include the terms France or the name of a French city. An equivalent work could not be done for a single university as there are so many uh, variants of names in the affiliations. Therefore, um, a different strategy had to be adopted. To build the corpus of the institution, I had to choose databases in which the extraction was possible and in which uh, the affiliations were reliable. After several attempts, the choice fell on a combination of five different sources, uh, Web of Science, PubMed, or Open Archive Hal, Lens.org, and data from article processing charges. And we don't have um, any subscription to Scopus. Um, these data sources um, do not allow extractions in the same format. Moreover, many publications are available in several sources at the same time. For example, in the Web of Science and in our open archive. It was therefore necessary to cross-reference uh, these data to remove duplicates, to harmonize them in order to obtain at the end a unified list. The Python language is particularly adapted to this type of automated file processing. The first step consisted in writing a code allowing to read, to process, to remove the duplicates from very heterogeneous sorry, <laughs> sources and to obtain at the end uh, the list of DOI uh, of all the publications uh, of the corpus. Um, so this first step uh, allowed us to build a corpus of about 20,500 publications for the period 2016-2020, um, or about um, 4,100 uh, 4, publications per year for uh, our uh, 2,400 researchers. The first step is already significant. Indeed, the evaluation uh, of research in France relies heavily on publications reported in the Web of Science, which is far from being exhaustive, and this is not its goal. However, uh, about 20% of the publications in the corpus are not in the web of science, uh, which is really uh, a significant share. The second step uh, of the project was to write the code to generate the graphs. Um, the graphs in the national monitor were written in JavaScript, a uh, language I don't know. That's why the graphs were rewritten in Python. The script allowing to obtain the open access status for each publication written by the ministry from, un from Unpaywall was reused as is, as well as the ministry's, ministry's script uh, allowing to assign a discipline to each publication. Finally, all these processes had to be brought together into a coherent uh, entity. 
The construction of an open science monitor at the scale of one institution could potentially interest many other universities and research organizations in France. This is why it seemed very important to me to think uh, from the beginning of the project on, uh, on how it could be reused. So I chose open source uh, tools to develop the code, namely GitLab to store the data and the scripts and Jupyter Notebooks uh, for the code itself. The idea was to offer a ready to use tool that other institutions could download and reuse by simply changing the extraction from the bibliographic databases to put their own. Jupyter Notebooks are interfaces in which you can mix text and code. And it's both um, very practical when you are a beginner in programming like me, um, because it allows you to check at each step if the code works. And it's also very practical to explain the code to beginners. Indeed, you can add text and images to the notebooks to make the code more easily understandable. So here is an example. Uh, all the comments are in French, but it's not really important for, for us now. Um, you can see the title in orange, how to clean data from the web of science. The subtitle indicates that the code will help to figure out how the file is structured the text gives more details. Then there is a line of code to execute. If there is a problem with the code, the interface will indicate it with an error message. Each line of code is commented in the same way so that anyone, even without any programming knowledge, can understand it and act on the code, for example, by changing the name of the institution. Now that we have seen how the code was constructed, let's take a closer look at the results obtained. The monitor um, is composed of eight graphs, each of which has a different purpose. The first graph gives a synthetic view of um, one year. Uh, the last version of the monitor of the University of Lorraine was generated in January 2021, and yet, it is the year 2019 that is highlighted. Indeed, many publications from 2020 are still under embargo and will only be in open access in a few months. This is why it is more relevant in order to have a real idea of the progress of open science to consider this time gap. And this is also the choice made by the National Monitor. So the University of Lorraine is in line with the French dynamic with a rate of open access that is fairly close, nearly 53% compared to 56% at the national level. This graph shows the different types of open access. Open access in an open archive, open access in an open archive and from a publisher at the same time, and um, open access from a publisher only. Obtaining the list of publications that are open access only from the publisher allows, for example, to warn the authors that their publications could also be archived in our open archive, which would ensure a perennial uh, con conservation. The second graph shows the evolution by year. The publications of the year two, um, uh, 2020 are less open than those of the year 2019 because of the embargoes. There is an increase in, uh, a clear increase between 2016 and 2018 publications with a slight decrease in 2019, which is also the year with the most publications. The graph by discipline is particularly illuminating because it shows how much habits can change depending on the scientific community. Mathematics on top leads the disciplines being the most open science friendly with a 73.9 rate, 0.9% uh, um, open rate for the publications of the year 2019. On the contrary, chemistry at the end 
is a, a rather weak performer with only 43.2% of publications in open access. However, it is important to measure the progress made by this discipline, chemistry, and this is one of the advantages of this tool, um, because we can see that in 2020, when the measurement was made on the publications from 2018, the open access rate was much lower at only 29.7%. A second representation by discipline allows us to visualize these disparities even more while underlining the lack of representativeness of databases. Indeed, the humanities are poorly referenced. The second representation, which was also carried out for the publishers and platforms, was not present in the National Monitor. It provides a more immediate vision of the important differences that, that can exist uh, between scientific communities in terms of open science and underlines the lack of visibility of certain disciplines in the most used databases and humanities in particular. The graph by publishers or platform allows us to see with whom our researchers publish the most. Here again, there are strong disparities, for example, between MDPI, whose publications are 100% open access, and, for example, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, whose publications are overwhelmingly in closed access. As for the graph by discipline, this graph by publisher platform has been enriched with a second visualization that highlights the crushing domination of Elsevier in the scientific production of Lorraine, since it alone represents one third of the publications of the year. In addition to the comparison between publishers, this graph allows us to know where the researchers of the University of Lorraine publish the most from right to left. This graph can thus be considered as a tool to help us to make a choice uh, in terms of unsubscriptions. To put an end to a subscription for, to Elsevier, for example, would not have neutral consequences in terms of access to our own um, scientific production. The interest of the deposit in our open archive of the full text of the publications is only more obvious. The approach by type of publication shows with, with force the omnipresence of the journal article in red within the databases to the detriment of other types of research products, um, such as the books or the datasets. Only conference proceedings in gold are visible along with the book chapters in orange. A final visualization allows us to identify the self-archiving platforms favored by researchers at the University of Lorraine. As at the national level, our National Open Archive, HAL, is predominant, but there is also a practice of multi-platform deposit with archive, for example. In order to understand this monitor, a few points should be taken into account. Only the publications with a DOI are usable because it is on this criterion that unpaywall works. There are therefore many publications that are not considered. The other bias of the monitor is that humanities and social sciences uh, disciplines are less well represented in the databases. These two biases are also present in the national monitor, so the comparison remains relevant. What can be done to reuse the University of Lorraine monitors for one's own institution? Well, it's very simple. You just have to go to the dedicated GitLab page, download the whole file, and let yourself be guided by reading the readme file step by step. Many institutions have been able to reuse the code since it was first put online. Eight universities have already done so, and about 10 others are currently working on it. 
If the comments of the code are in French, the code is nevertheless quite usable by universities outside France, since the Web of Science, PubMed or Lens.org are international databases. To complete this, these indicators, new graphs had been added in spring 2021. Indeed, open science is not limited to the opening of publications, but represents a much broader ecosystem. These additional graphs had been, have been made with Excel. Indeed, they focus on the costs of article processing charges and on open science training, data that are necessarily uh, very specific to the institution and cannot be reused by others. We note a strong increase in these expenses over time, testifying that uh, testifying of the growing importance of uh, this new way uh, to publish. Finally, in order to measure the awareness raising actions carried out by the institution, we have focused on training in open science through three graphs, training of doctoral students, training and support for the data management plan, training and support for the use of the open archive how. What conclusions can be drawn from this work? Well, from these graphs, some lines of work can be outlined for the future. The continuous increase in the rate of open access to publications is the product of a constant effort that must be maintained. The awareness and training of researchers in open science require a sustained effort and human resources. Openness is still far from being automatic in scientific production. Some disciplines could be the object of particular attention, notably through more recurrent training. If certain scientific communities, such as mathematics, have a long practice of publishing in open access, others are still extremely reluctant. The publishers with whom our researchers operate are consistent with a worldwide trend of editorial concentration, which must be diversified. A third of the articles published by researchers at the University of Lorraine are published by Elsevier. And subscribing from these publishers may result in the end of access to our own researchers' publications. The University of Lorraine, like many other universities, has chosen to unsubscribe from Springer and the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, for example. Non-journal publications must be more widely referenced through the systematic use of a DOI. The Lorraine Open Science Monitor is a steering tool that allows the university to measure the progress of open science and open access uh, within its scientific production. In this respect, it constitutes a set of original indicators complementary to traditional bibliometrics. Designed from the outset as a tool that can be reused by other institutions, it should be enriched as it is reused. It is not intended to evaluate research, but to become a tool to help an institution establish an effective plan, action plan to make open science progress at its level. How will um, it evolve? Leticia, yeah. you uh, have one minute. Thanks. Um, how will it evolve? The monitor will be updated every year. It is also planned to integrate new indicators on research data and software codes. And I'm finished. So thank you very much for your attention. And feel free to ask uh, any questions. Thank you, Leticia. Uh, also, well in time, I have to say, uh, all presenters have done a terrific job <laughs> uh, in their time management. OK. Uh, thank you. We uh, did have uh, some questions uh, coming in. Um, let me, so please don't hesitate to add uh, your questions uh, in the chat. We do have some time, uh, time left uh, to discuss. A first question that came in was from uh, Paul Irish. Uh, 
um, let me read it out. Um, it was uh, a question for Massimo. Uh, uh, Massimo, is the level of behavior accepting open access publications or not different in different subject areas? If so, it is, is it not the researcher culture in these communities which needs to change if open science is to succeed? Um, yeah, I think it's it's a very uh, good point that's being made. And I think uh, Letizia quite nicely illustrated it with regard to the University of Loren that there are indeed differences in different disciplines uh, with regard to the degree to which uh, researchers engage in open access publishing already. So indeed, there are differences in, uh, in culture, depending on the discipline for uh, one reason or another that I'm also not uh, an expert of. But um, I totally agree with uh, then your, uh, the second point that what needs to, to change is the research culture towards, uh, yeah, towards disciplines that where it is more the norm to start uh, to publish in open access journals. And I think what I presented today are more kind of uh, tools to try to move uh, researchers towards uh, open access publishing. Take, for example, uh, the um, communication of injunctive and descript descriptive norms. So uh, telling researchers that uh, people, uh, that other fellow researchers in the discipline um, are engaging in it already or that they value it if uh, you were to do it. So these are things that uh, if that's not the case yet, communicating these things might help to establish a culture. But in the end, that's also one of the main conclusions we draw in the paper, is that actually once that kind of uh, uh, research culture is established, a self-perpetuating effect is expected. So if you're in a research group where uh, many others already publish in open access, uh, journals, you are more likely to be then exposed to the fact that others do it or that others value it, or yeah, you are also more likely to be exposed to the issue itself and so on. So I think indeed the aim will be to establish a strong culture uh, across uh, various disciplines. There are differences, I think, as of now, but uh, indeed the goal in the end is to establish this culture because once it's established, the things that I talked about today will uh, are likely to yeah, be encouraged in that setting. So I think that's also a very good question. Okay, maybe um, building on that question, uh, there is a, a question uh, from Vanessa Proudman who's asking, have you already worked with any libraries on how to apply your methods to new areas of change beyond what you described today? Um, yeah, that's also a yeah, an interesting uh, thought. Uh, I haven't uh, worked with any libraries yet, uh, particular to, to do it, but um, if you have a look at the publication itself, we try to always write everything in rather abstract terms so that the same model and approach can be applied with different goals in mind, different uh, groups of people, whether it's maybe young or uh, more senior researchers or different disciplines where different goals might be important. Or, so there are many factors that can be, I think, due to the fact that we made it so abstract, could be uh, explored with the same um, strategy. And I think uh, from the experience that we had also writing this, uh, uh, this article where we were working with uh, also librarian but uh, also more people, uh, uh, others who are more familiar with uh, the uh, open access publication schemes and so on. And what was uh, interesting there that even uh, writing it in such abstract terms and putting it at the hand of uh, people, it is still in the end, uh, I think important or it can be make things easier if there's still a behavioral scientist to interpret and help in the uh, translation uh, of these things if you want to uh, yeah, um, apply it to a different, to a certain uh, domain or to, uh, to foster open access publishing at a certain library. 
uh, and so on. Uh, and yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting idea. And I could, how I could imagine it would be to I don't know organize a seminar uh, where people have uh, questions or when you work with a library and you can try to uh, yeah use the same method to. I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it's an interesting thought and totally doable. Uh, I think it would be a, an interesting a path forward to collaborate in that sense. Yeah. Okay, I think we can see this as an uh, invitation. <laughs> <laughs> of yeah. course, always welcome to uh, reach out if there is if there are more questions or if there's interest. Yeah. Okay, and maybe uh, building on that, uh, the teacher. Um, uh, from your experience with the uh, with the monitor and and the differences in those communities uh do you at the uni uh, at the university uh, of Lorraine have a plan already to tackle uh those or are you just still in the monitoring phase and not yet in the in the building a plan uh, phase or uh in what in what stage are you so um, the first version of the monitor was released um, one um, yeah one year ago, uh, and uh, it's been updated uh, in January. So um, we are uh, uh, looking for improving uh, the monitor uh, with new um, uh, scientific. Uh, uh, publications uh, such as data sets or uh, software codes. So that's for the monitoring part. But um, yeah, we have uh, also um, actions uh, at different levels. Uh, we, we are enforcing uh, our, tr our trainings um, and especially uh, during the pandemics, uh, we've, uh, we have realized that we, we were able to um, to do a lot more of trainings if uh, they are done online. So we have increased a lot uh, our, our trainings on, about open science uh, in uh, our scientific community. Uh, we have also some initiatives. Um, there is, uh, for example, an open publications uh, steering, um, operational committee, uh, which is working uh, on recommendations about article processing charges and uh, publications um, um, topics uh, in general to enhance uh, the comprehension of um, open science um, issues uh, among uh, the researchers, especially on the angle of, um, um, of um, the payment of article processing charges, for example. And we also have um, uh, it's really new, it's from a few months ago, uh, a new community among our, our researchers. Um, so we have called it um, Les Ambassadeurs des Données. Uh, it's a French version of uh, data champions. And we are uh, training them and we hope that they will um, little by little um, convince uh, their colleagues that uh, all these topics are important. So, yeah, we have um, we have an action plan which is um, uh, based on training and recommendations at the same time. Okay, then maybe it's interesting to see the results of that next year. Or even. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> would be happy um, to. Yeah. Paul Iris also had another uh, question for you, uh, Leticia Eva May. Uh, with the French Open Access Monitor, do the results increase year on year in terms of percentages of material available in open access? Does the monitor, in other words, drive compliance towards open access? Yeah, so at a, a national level, uh, yes, open access is growing uh, every year. and. We can see that um, uh, even in uh, disciplines where open access is not uh, really um, the default <laughs> mode, uh, such as uh, in chemistry, for example, we see uh, some improvements. So yeah, I think um, this monitor um, can be seen as a, a, a soft um, a, a soft incentive. Uh, 
to um yeah to promote open science and yes uh i think it's working um, because we can see a clear uh, improvement over the years okay uh there was a remark for you uh Letitia. also can you provide relevant links to your code and information for institutions outside of uh, france yes i'm sending okay. the gitlab uh, repository right now okay um, then uh, Nicoletta there uh, and uh, Frederic, I'm sorry, uh, a question also from Paul Iris, who's our question champ. Uh, uh, the mega journal approach uh, in Delft looks great. Is it more popular with some subject areas than others, given that the platform contains a plethora of uh, subject publications, reviews, and formats? Yes, I will answer that question. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, there is a huge difference. Um, mostly, like Leticia says, people who are using GitLab, Jupyter Notes, they are more likely to embrace open science, open open access, open publishing. So our most of our people are from uh, the Faculty of Mathematics and also from IO space, because those people are really uh, use uh, Jupyter Notes and also from uh, um, computer science. Um, um, it, we see like, for example, we talk about uh, what uh, Nicoleta was talking about, mm -hmm. the one of our uh, uh, professor we are working with, uh, he wants to publish video abstracts, but of course he already has his YouTube channel, you know, because we are not fast enough to provide uh, the solution. So he already has his YouTube channel, he's already doing his own thing, but he would like this to be recognized, and that's where we come in with the Evolved Scholar. So there is a huge difference uh, in terms of uh, discipline. And also now we are working with people from urbanism. They are falling under the architect faculty of architecture. Mm -hmm. And you also have some people with, it doesn't matter if their discipline do not traditionally um, want to publish this way. They are a strong believer in open science. So they just want to go for it. So whatever they do, because they say they have a stage of their career, they don't need to you know, publish in a, I don't know, nature or the higher impact factor journal, they just want to publish open access, but they know the reality, they have to help their uh, students. So they are, you know, it's a bit in this balance, but those people, we are working with them also um, toward this goal. Okay. Can you say uh, something about uh, numbers of requests that you that you get and, and if there's uh, what numbers are we talking about of uh, uh, publications that that you are or researchers uh, that you are helping out with uh, solutions so i started less than two years ago at the tudf with this position mm -hmm. i would say over these two years about 20 requests but um in a term because we are new because the portfolio we do have open access journal open books open textbooks um, I think now we are working with four and five researchers. So as a conference paper, that's something easy to, to proceed, the data pay review, because we okay. work with the 40U. So I will say about 20 the last two years, and uh, it always starts, you have this request in January, February, of course, and you have, it coincides when people have finished their, <laughs> their paper and they want to publish somewhere. So you really have this peak, you have this peak also in May, and then it's silent and you have a peak in October. So that's the way it works. Okay, typical. <laughs> typical. Yeah. Okay, unless uh, anyone from the other speakers would like to add uh, something, then we have covered all uh, the questions. Um, so we can uh, conclude uh, this session for today. I must say that it was very interesting and in preparing and talking in advance of this session to each other, uh, new ideas were, were raised and contacts were, uh, uh, were established. And I think it was very nice to see how the different, uh, the different uh, talks um, uh, worked, uh, worked together to, to, to bring something. And I really enjoyed that. So, uh, Dear speakers, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I found it very, uh, very interesting uh, to do. And of course, I would also like uh, to thank all the participants in the sessions, uh, also for the questions. And you have five minutes left.
before the next session starts. So uh, thank you. Uh, and just remember that the uh, presentation, uh, the recording and the, the, the slides will be uh, shortly after uh, Liebach finishes will be available uh, online. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Okay.